Government Information Agency program that keeps you updated on what the government has been doing. For the details, I'm your host, Vindy Tomeshwar. With the aim of strengthening the enforcement capabilities of the police, a contract was recently signed between the government of Guyana and the Washington-based Emergence Group for the provision of consultancy services for the establishment of a SWAT team. This initiative, which won the approval of the cabinet earlier this month, was long in the making. It will provide a special team of officers with the training, temperament, and expertise to apply critical judgment in difficult situations. There have been some uh, comments, lots of comments in the media ever since the announcement was made in respect to the government's intention to establish this team. Uh, public opinion, um, there are two views. One is welcome, one it is not welcome. One is going to be a silver bullet to solve crime. The other is not going to be a silver bullet to solve crime. And the only way in which we'll be able to bring the crime situation under control is with my demittal of office. In the meantime, while I'm here, uh, steps will be taken to address from all necessary angles the crime situation and the need to set up a SWAT team was a matter that had been long established and announced by the government. The Emergence Group designs and implements world-class law enforcement and justice sector reform programs around the world. The company partners with governments and international donors to strengthen civilian security institutions. And we have identified, uh, I think, some, some individuals who, uh, who will be coming down here in the near future. Uh, first, to take a, a look and to take an assessment of, uh, of uh, existing uh, capabilities, existing equipment, existing skills, uh, and then to develop a, uh, a country-specific, Guyanese-specific program uh, that involves both training and, and mentoring and sort of uh, you know, exercises that will develop uh, a component uh, of the police force uh, which will be uh, better equipped and better prepared to deal with serious uh, issues. Meanwhile, the Home Affairs Ministry also handed over land and water transport to the value of $17 million to community policing groups in the various police divisions across the country. This is all in a conscious effort to enhance public safety and security throughout the country. The Ghana Forestry Commission has received a $10 million grant to support the advancement of the Low Carbon Development Strategy and the Commission's Red Plus Readiness Package. The Government of Guyana has embarked on a national program that aims to protect and maintain the state's forests in an effort to reduce global carbon emissions while attracting resources to foster economic growth. The World Wildlife Fund's latest grant will go towards supporting Guyana's Red Plus effort. The Ghana Forestry Commission is the lead body on the Red Plus activities and certainly been doing a tremendous lot of work, um, especially in terms of if you look at the partnership with the government of Norway in developing the monitoring, reporting and verification uh, system. We're the only country that, have, that has currently a national scale MRV and, and all the countries have been looking to us um, for support and for guidance. And certainly this, the, the work that we will undertake within this project will give impetus and will support for those activities. The WWF believes that Guyana's biomass, which covers 80% of land area, and its abundant water supply and rich biodiversity are assets that will grow more valuable over time. In the Guyana Shield, we have some of the um, largest percent of rainforest cover left on Earth. and. Um, it's important, Guyana has taken a lead in this area, and it's important we, we continue to be in the lead to, to show the world uh, the way that we can make money by conserving our forests. Work on the conservation of Guyana's forests started over five years ago, and thus far a lot of progress has been achieved. Tremendous progress would have been made in, num in a number of key areas. Um, some of us would have seen reports in the media and also published in the GFC website summarizing efforts on the MRV, the Monitoring, Reporting and Verification System on Red Plus. In addition to that, we would have seen the wide range of work executed under the auspices of the LCDS focused on readiness, policy preparedness, as well as consultation and stakeholder engagement. Of recent, a number of activities have started on examining the more technical aspects on reference level. 
all of these fall under um, the general umbrella of the Forest Carbon Partnership Facility, the FCPF. The Red Plus forms the operational mechanism for the LCDS strategic framework to be executed and monitored. Guyana joined the world in celebrating World Food Day under the theme Sustainable Food Systems for Food Security and Nutrition, with a call for everyone to play a part in eliminating hunger and malnutrition. If tomorrow comes and there is one hungry child or one hungry brother, or one hungry sister, it will be an indictment of all of us who live in this world today. And I do believe that we should take it as our moral responsibility as peoples and as nations to ensure that we put the systems in place that at the very least would ensure that no one goes hungry. World Food Day established by the FAO is celebrated worldwide every year on October 16 since 1979 and serves to bring heightened awareness to the problem of world hunger. 70% of the world's hungry people live in rural areas and depend for their livelihoods mainly on food production. And so, on this World Food Day, let us share our thoughts and experiences on how best to address these two great challenges. How to translate rising food availability into better nutrition for all people, and how to make the necessary shift to environmentally and socially sustainable production and consumption systems. We can all play a part in this through changing our own lifestyles and must do so if we are to correct the dreadful food situation that I have just described. As part of the ministry's World Food Day activity, prominence was also placed on cassava and a small exhibition of cassava products and food were facilitated. Cassava is one of the crops that the Agriculture Ministry has targeted for development. The ministry is providing technical support for cassava products implemented in the hinterland communities to boost production. The school feeding program continues to benefit thousands of nursery and grades 1 and 2 students. Since its introduction, there has been significant change with regards to school attendance and performance rates. This year's budgetary allocation of $1.1 billion to the National School Feeding Program will benefit 64,000 children in the form of juice and fortified biscuits or hot meals. My name is Roberto. Henry, I like eating biscuits, biscuits, and The Hot Meals program is being carried out in the hinterland where local farmers provide vegetables and fruits. The school feeding program is geared at alleviating hunger for underprivileged school children in the hinterland communities and on the coastland. My name is Akia and the school that I attend is St. Gabriel's Primary School. Thank you to the Ministry of Education for providing the juice and the biscuit for us to eat. The snack which is distributed to the students of the nursery school and primary students is part of the government's plan to eradicate illiteracy. The Ministry of Local Government and Regional Development will commence engagement with neighborhood democratic councils and elected appointed officers to discuss the new legal electoral environment in which the next local government elections will be held. Minister of Local Government Ganga Pasad has stated that the information discussed with the councillors and staff as part of the public awareness program will centre on matters regarding the legislation, those eligible to vote and the electoral process. He explained that approval has been given to the Guyana Elections Commission to post and display materials as 7 to 1 local authorities. From around November 18th, the Ministry of Local Government and Regional Development will seek to engage our NDCs, elected as well as appointed officers in clusters, discussing and deliberating on the new electoral environment 
legal environment in which the next local government elections will be held. The minister also pointed out that the local government bills being reviewed by the Attorney General Chambers will soon be completed. He reiterated that there is no hindrance to the local government elections. It is our intention to, to once again seek to provide the necessary training and support to our neighborhood democratic council so that they can successfully complete the preparation um, and budget 2014. He observed that the cycle of continuous registration being conducted by GCOM will conclude by November 23. There's more to come, please stay tuned. With the Amila Falls Hydropower Project, all consumers will benefit from cheap and reliable electricity. In fact, reduction in consumer tariffs will be at least 20% in 2017 and considerably more in the years ahead. This project will save residential, commercial and industrial entities approximately 3.5 billion US dollars over a period of 20 years. At present, it costs about 25 cents per kilowatt hour to generate electricity using heavy fuel oil and about 30 to 35 cents per kilowatt hour using diesel. With a miler, Guyana will save a dramatic 20 to 25 percent on its fuel importation bill, or about 90 million US dollars. Investors' confidence in Guyana will increase, and the manufacturing and services sector will be significantly boosted. In the climate change arena, Guyana has already taken on a leadership role with its low carbon development strategy, and with this Amila project, the country could also become a leader globally for renewable power. This project will add 6 percentage points to real GDP growth during the construction phase alone. The total public debt to Guyana for this project is zero. Cheap energy is vital to the industrialization of Guyana. Thousands of jobs would be created due to industrialization. After 20 years, the hydropower facility will be 100% owned by Guyanese and it is expected to last 100 years. Guyana needs the Amalia Falls Hydropower Project because all consumers will benefit from cheap and reliable electricity. Consumers will save approximately 3.5 billion US dollars over a period of 20 years. Ghana will save 90 million US dollars on fuel importation and investors' confidence in Guyana will increase. More jobs will be available. All Guyanese need to come on board now. Reduction in consumer tariffs will be at least 20%. Millions of taxpayers' dollars have already been spent on the Amalia Falls Hydropower Project, which is now in its final stages of achieving financial closure. However, the APNU and AFC teamed up in Parliament to kill the project without any valid reason, and in so doing taking cheap electricity out of the reach of Guyanese. Frustrating a project of this magnitude at this stage is tantamount to strangling the country's development and putting at stake the future of every man, woman and child. Ghana is set to join its international partners in phasing out the use of mercury in the mining sector. The government of Guyana has signed on to a new international pact to control mercury emissions, the Minimata Convention on Mercury. This was done during an international conference hosted by the United Nations Environmental Program, the UNEP, and held in Minimata, Japan from October 9 to 11, 2013. Ghana's Natural Resources and Environment Minister, Robert Posad, held bilateral discussions with his Japanese counterpart, Nibituru Ishihara, who reiterated his country's plan to provide two billion U.S. dollars in financial assistance to help fight mercury pollution. Discussions were also held with UNEP Executive Director, Dr. Achim Steiner, to support Guyana's phasing out measures. As part of the convention too, um, there will be no new mercury mining, but rather countries that are already engaged will be given 20 years after the convention comes into being to produce mercury. Um, because mercury is not only used for mining, it's used in the health sector, it's used to um, produce different and fluorescent lights and so forth, a range of activities. So over time, it will perhaps be, force be scarce, 
and then not be available. The main aim of the action plan is to minimize and, where feasible, eliminate mercury releases to air, water, and land from waste by adopting environmentally sound management practices. It was proposed that the plan to be implemented and completed within five years of its approval be instituted between the years 2013 to 2017. The construction of a warm-up pool at the aquatic center will result in Ghana being able to host more international swim meets. The prefabricated 25 by 21 meter pool will be assembled by the German-based Merter Pool Company at a cost of 258,000 US dollars after the base and other itinerary works are completed by a local contractor. The pool company was recommended by FINA, the international governing body of swimming, diving, water polo, synchronized swimming and open water swimming competitions. Once we have these two facilities in place, it would provide not only for training, but it would also provide when we have international competition, that we have somewhere close by where we can do the warm-ups so that people can swim uh, competitively in the 50-meter pool. So that was a promise that we have made, and that's a promise that we are now fulfilling. Uh, from the technical side, we have uh, had the engineers work on the design of the pool and we, we are now implementing that design. The pool that would be built, it's also a, a prefab pool, like the 50 meter one, and the warranties are the same. The locally contracted set of works began September 15 with the removal of several pipelines and the excavation of the site commenced September 23rd. The new pool is being constructed on a concrete strip foundation which has been deemed adequate given the size of the pool. All of the materials necessary for the project are on site along with heavy duty equipment. The Lillendale Aquatic Center is the brainchild of former president Dr. Bart Jagdio who saw the need to improve local sports using modern facilities. The Ministry of Education has officially introduced the delivery of Portuguese at the secondary level. It is anticipated that in a few years, Guyanese students will be able to sit the subject at the CSEC examinations. The Education Minister is of the view that by learning the language, Guyana's and Brazil's relationship will be further strengthened. Importantly, students will be able to communicate with the growing number of Brazilians in Guyana. And while language will never stop Guyana from enjoying good relations with anyone, surely our familiarity with the language of the people of Brazil will, boast, will help us to bolster that friendship and the relations that we enjoy, the benefits that we could get, the stories that we, the experiences that we could share to help us contribute to their country also. And so for us, this is uh, another step in extending um, our relations with the Brazilian government and her people. The preparation of the Portuguese learning materials commenced with uncertainty. Nevertheless, they were completed in time for the new school year. At the first meeting of the committee held on Friday, April 12th, the strongest asset to this project was discovered. And Madam Chair, what was the strongest asset to this project? Three of our own teachers, Ms. Candida Williams, HOD Modern Languages Department, at Queen's College, Ms. Diane Blemman, Modern Languages teacher, also from the Queen's College, and Malkia Pei, Modern Languages teacher from the Bishop's High School. And what was special about these three teachers? They know Portuguese. They were willing to assist each other in the preparation of the curriculum. And they were willing to research, collate, collect and collate curriculum materials for the program to be introduced in schools in September 2013. The new curriculum will be administered at five secondary schools where there are teachers who are fluent in Portuguese. These are Queen's College, Bishop's High, St. Stanislaus College, St. Rose's, and St. Joseph's High School. The world is accelerating in the quest of becoming a global village. So there is need for Guyanese citizens to be conversant in more, in more than one language. Currently, our schools offer exposure to French and Spanish, but we have recognized the population trend of a growing number of Portuguese-speaking inhabitants in Guyana. There's more to come. Please stay tuned.
With the Amaila Falls Hydro Power Project, all consumers will benefit from cheap and reliable electricity. In fact, reduction in consumer tariffs will be at least 20% in 2017 and considerably more in the years ahead. This project will save residential, commercial and industrial entities approximately 3.5 billion US dollars over a period of 20 years. At present, it costs about 25 cents per kilowatt hour to generate electricity using heavy fuel oil and about 30 to 35 cents per kilowatt hour using diesel. With a miler, Guyana will save a dramatic 20 to 25 percent on its fuel importation bill, or about 90 million US dollars. Investors' confidence in Guyana will increase, and the manufacturing and services sector will be significantly boosted. In the climate change arena, Guyana has already taken on a leadership role with its low carbon development strategy. And with this Amaila project, the country could also become a leader globally for renewable power. This project will add 6 percentage points to real GDP growth during the construction phase alone. The total public debt to Guyana for this project is zero. Cheap energy is vital to the industrialization of Guyana. Thousands of jobs would be created due to industrialization. After 20 years, the hydropower facility will be 100% owned by Guyanese and it is expected to last 100 years. Guyana needs the Amalia Falls hydropower project because all consumers will benefit from cheap and reliable electricity. Consumers will save approximately 3.5 billion US dollars over a period of 20 years. Ghana will save 90 million US dollars on fuel importation and investors' confidence in Guyana will increase. More jobs will be available. All Guyanese need to come on board now. Reduction in consumer tariffs will be at least 20%. Millions of taxpayers' dollars have already been spent on the Amalia Falls hydropower project, which is now in its final stages of achieving financial closure. However, the APNU and AFC teamed up in Parliament to kill the project without any valid reason and in so doing taking cheap electricity out of the reach of Guyanese. Frustrating a project of this magnitude at this stage is tantamount to strangling the country's development and putting at stake the future of every man, woman and child. During Cabinet's meeting on October 15, President Donald Ramatar and his Cabinet discussed several issues of national concern. These were subsequently brought to the attention of the media. Cabinet at its October 15 statutory meeting granted its no objections to seven contracts in the areas of infrastructure and health. The government is calling for a rejection of the opposition's response to crime-fighting and crime-prevention measures and national security interventions that have been taken before the National Assembly by Minister Clement Rohi. Their rejection of Minister Rohi, their rejection as a consequence of the administration's interventions, crime fighting, crime prevention, law enforcement, national security, their posturing continue to expose Guyanese and punish Guyanese and making them the victims of this their actions that vicariously embolden criminals. Similarly, the conflict of interest claims by opposition commentators against Mrs. Gitanjali Singh of the Audit Office of Guyana was also denounced by the government. The premature pronouncements by the tree essentially prejudicing the outcome of ongoing investigations by professional bodies into this putative conflict of interest situation occasion by Jitanjali's husband being the Minister of Finance. The obvious gender discrimination in this charade of conflict of interest 
cabinet contending cannot be allowed. Singh is a chartered accountant and has served at the audit office in senior positions for several years. Meanwhile, time is running out for the passage and enactment of the anti-money laundering and countering the financing of terrorism bill as a result of the delaying tactics at the level of the parliament. Delays, delays, and more delays. All in the face of impending disaster. Ghana stands to be affected by various sanctions if the bill is not passed before November 18, 2013. And that has brought us to the end of this week's program. Here's a recap of the highlights. Ghana Forestry Commission receives $10 million grant, World Food Day celebrated, and preparations intensify for the holding of local government elections. Remember that Weekly Digest and other government information can be found on our website www.gina.gov.gy or you can send us your comments and suggestions at gina.gina.gov.gy. Thank you for watching and do join us again next week for another program. Until then, be safe and have a great week ahead. Goodbye.